So we just talked about indications for drug therapy, and now what we're going to do is talk about some of the specific antiarrhythmic drugs that we'll be using in class uh, to understand better their uh, clinical utility. So the way these antiarrhythmic drugs are classified is by their effect on the various channels or um, elements that mediate their effect. And this classification is known as the Vaughn Williams classification. So the class 1 drugs are the sodium channel blockers, the class 2 drugs are the beta blockers, the class 3 drugs are the potassium channel blockers, and the class 4 drugs are the calcium channel blockers. There are also two important uh, drugs that kind of fall into this that are, that are non-classified. They're outside of the Vaughn Williams classification, adenosine and digoxin. So I listed them here as non-classified, and their effects are various. So class one antiarrhythmics, and this is really the most complicated out of all four classes. So once we get through this, it'll all sort of be downhill from here. So the class one antiarrhythmics are sodium channel blockers, and they're uh, further subdivided into three subclasses. But first, let's talk about uh, the mechanism of how sodium channel blockers work. Uh, and this mechanism applies across all three of the subclasses, class one A, B, and C. So depicted here is a diagram of normal sodium channel opening. On the far left is the sodium channel at rest. And you can see that there's an M gate and an H gate. And at rest, the M gate is closed and the H gate is open. The sodium channel is, is ready to be activated. When the sodium channel is activated, the M gate's open, the H gate remains open. And so now the sodium channel uh, is in active state. The conductance to sodium is very high. Uh, sodium can flux in and the membrane potential can depolarize or become more positive. The next thing that happens is that the H gate closes, which means that the sodium channel is inactivated. Uh, the M gate is open at this time, but the H gate is closed. So that the way it opens and the way it closes uh, is different. And the, mon the mnemonic I always use, and, and remember it's kind of silly, is the M gate is the activation gate or the MACtivation gate, and the H gate is the inactivation gate or the HIN-activation gate. I think someone told me that in lecture when I was in med school, and it's sort of stuck since then. So MACtivation and HIN-activation. This is important because sodium channel blockers only bind to the uh, sodium channel when the sodium channel is in the either activated conformation or the inactivated conformation. And the reason that's important is because the sodium channel can only get into these conformations after it's activated, right? Because um, if it's at rest, it's at rest. It's never in the activated or inactivated conformation. But every time the sodium channel opens, it goes into the activated state and then the inactivated state and then finally the resting state. So this means that sodium channel blockers have more drug effect in tachycardia because the more often the, the sodium channels are activated, which occurs when the heart rate is faster, the more often uh, sodium channel blockers have opportunities to bind to the activation and uh, rather the activated and inactivated conformations of the channel, which is a nice property to have in a drug that you're trying to use to treat tachycardia. It works more in tissues that are more um, uh, tachycardic. So, Sodium channel blockers are subdivided into class 1A, uh, 1B, and 1C drugs. And these drugs vary up across um, two important sort of um, properties. So the first property that 1A, 1B, and 1C drugs are differentiated by is by the potency of their effect on the sodium channel. 1A drugs are medium potency, 1B drugs are low potency, and 1C drugs are high potency. So if you look at the phase zero slope depicted in the third column, you can see that the 1A drugs sort of have a medium effect on the slope of phase zero because they have a medium effect on sodium channels. The 1B drugs have a low effect on uh, the phase zero slope. And the 1C drugs have the highest effect on um, the slope of phase zero because they have the highest effect on sodium channels. So sodium channel blockers vary in their effect on phase zero. 
Sodium channel blockers also vary in their effect on action potential duration, and this is probably because sodium channel blockers all have some um, effect on the potassium channels as well. So you can see that class 1A drugs lengthen the action potential duration, they prolong the QT interval, that's the surface manifestation of what's happening in the action potentials. The class 1B drugs shorten the action potential duration, and the class 1C drugs have uh, no effect on the action potential duration. So the key point here is class 1A drugs can lengthen the action potential duration, which leads to a prolonged QT interval on the surface electrocardiogram. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the individual drugs. And there's a couple of drugs within the class uh, 1A that you should know about. The first one we're gonna discuss is procanamide. It's a class 1A antiarrhythmic. Um, and it can be used, well, we'll talk about how it'll be used, but the, the, the side effects of it are um, drug-induced lupus, which can cause arthralgia, uh, pleuritis, and pericarditis with the oral formulation, uh, which is not clinically available in the United States. And because of its properties of prolonging the QT interval, it can cause torsade. Um, and importantly, uh, it's got a first-pass metabolite called N-acetylprocanamide, which sometimes goes by the shorter name of NAPA. Uh, it's a first-pass metabolite that has even stronger potassium channel activity. So some people who um, metabolize procanamide differently can really get an accumulation of this metabolite uh, and have even more marked QT prolong prolongation. Now, you might think it's a little strange that I'm starting uh, the drug section with the side effects, but that's really because the side effects are pretty... Um, important um, so that you know how to use the drugs clinically, but also because we're going to lump together at the end sort of the use of all the drugs across the classes. So the next class 1A drug to know about is quinidine. And the unique thing about quinidine is that it has uh, vagolytic effects in addition to its effects on the sodium channel. So some of its side effects are mediated by these vagal vagolytic properties, including urinary ret retention, uh, constipation, a blurry vision, and dried mouth. Uh, synchronism is a specific type of CNS toxicity seen with qu quinidine overdose. Uh, and with that, you get tinnitus and psychosis. And again, because of its QT prolonging interval, uh, QT interval prolongation, inherent in all class 1A drugs, uh, you can get torsade with quinidine. The third class 1A drug to know about is disopyramide. And again, this drug has uh, quite strong vagolytic effects. And in addition, independently of its sodium channel blocking capabilities, it has negative inotropic effects. So its uh, vagolytic effects can again lead to urinary retention, constipation, blurred vision, and dried mouth. Uh, and again, because of its QT prolongation, uh, it can lead to torsade. Okay, so that's the class 1A antiarrhythmics to know about. Class 1B consists of lidocaine and mixilatine. And lidocaine is the same lidocaine that you hear about in the dentist's office that uh, helps block transmission of uh, pain uh, in nerve conduction. So again, a sodium channel blocker. And these drugs have a special property that um, that caused them to be sort of used in ventricular tachycardia in the setting of ischemia. And that is that um, in ischemic tissue, you have tissue that is more depolarized, just inherently. So when the tissue is more depolarized, uh, the channels are more likely to be found in an activated or an inactivated state which means that lidocaine can preferentially bind in ischemic tissue. So that makes it a nice property to use this drug in the setting of myocardial infarction because we think that um, the drug sort of uh, preferentially binds in the area where it's most needed, the, the area of ischemic tissue. Uh, with class 1B drugs, uh, a really important side effect to know about is its effect on CNS toxicity. A patient can be confused, uh, become delirious, or get grand mal seizures. So that's class 1B drugs. Uh, now we'll get into the class 1C drugs. And, and what the drugs to know about there are flecainide and propafenone. And these drugs have 
really potent negative inotropic effects, recall, recall from that first graph um, that I showed earlier. So they have very potent sodium channel blocking effects and therefore very potent negative inotropic effects. Propafenone, it's important to know that it has additional beta blocking effects. And um, both of these drugs can really slow conduction because of its potent sodium channel blocking. So it can, uh, it can affect the AV node and therefore it's contraindicated uh, in LV systolic dysfunction and in heart block. So that's class 1A antiarrhythmics. Now we'll get into the class 2 antiarrhythmics, which are the beta blockers. And you've heard about beta blockers elsewhere in SBM, and you'll also hear about it um, a little bit later on. So the two beta blockers that we'll kind of just keep in mind are esmolol, which is an IV formulation, and metoprolol, which is an oral formulation. But the properties from an electrophysiological standpoint are pretty similar across all the beta blockers. And the main thing to know about how beta blockers are useful in treating rhythm disturbances is its effect on the AV node and the SA node in pacemaker type tissues. And what beta blockers do by blocking adrenergic tone is prolong phase four depolarization. So this slows down uh, the um, activity of AV nodal cells and SA nodal cells. And the important side effects of beta blockers are hypotension um, and bradycardia. And also, uh, beta blockers can cause depression, bronchospasm, cognitive impairment, and sexual dysfunction.